keep moving <laughs> past that. Uh, she bequeathed her papers, uh, books, and literary rights to OSU with the sincere wish that anything which proves worth keeping in this bequest will be of use to future students of the university. Typical Angie DeVoe modesty. Uh, the collection which is housed in our special collections and university archives at the Edmund Lowell Library on the campus consists of research material including manuscripts, publications, and presentations by Angie DeVoe and related legal papers and correspondence. And the Angie DeVoe Room of Special Collections and University Archives is also my, I hate to admit this, but hideaway office at the university. I keep sitting there thinking Angie DeVoe's wisdom will come through and I'll know what to do next, but so far she's kept it to herself. Uh, in 1957 and in 1958, Angie taught uh, Oklahoma history here at OSU. In 76, she received the rarely awarded but very distinguished Henry G. Bennett Service Award from OSU. And in 1982, the OSU History Department established the Angie DeBow Award for Oklahoma History. As I say, she was honored in the state, uh, by the state of Oklahoma by having her portrait hung in the rotunda of the state capitol and characteristically of Angie, she called it a public hanging. <laughs> There's a lot of people here today uh, that need to be recognized, but won't be. We're gonna move, we're gonna move, we're gonna move quickly here because I wanna get to the main event and the unveiling. But I do want to recognize the tribal representatives that are here who played such an important role in this effort and uh, if you're here please stand so and we'll recognize everyone at the end uh, for the Apache tribe uh, chairman Louis Manahona and other representatives of the Apaches uh, for the chair of the Cherokee Nation Paula Ragsdale and Ginger Brown the Chickasaw Nation we will introduce uh, Governor Bill Anatubby uh, in a moment Choctaw Nation Jerry Tomlinson the Delaware Nation Jenna Browler the Iowa tribe Renee Prince the Kaw Nation, Karen Howe, and Frida Lane. The Kalegi Tribal Town, uh, Miko Tiger Hobia. Uh, the Kekapu Tribe Executive uh, Director, Kristen Wilson, and other representatives of the Kickapoos. And the Modoc Tribe, Chief Bill Follis. The Muscogee Creek Nation National Council Speaker, uh, Roger Barnett, and other representatives. The Oto Missouri Tribe, uh, Willis Robodeau. A Pawnee Nation, President George Howe, uh, Ponca Nation, Vice uh, Chairman Earl Howe III, Seminole Nation, Natalie Deer, and other representatives, the Shawnee Nation, Chairman Rod Sparkman, uh, the Thabloco Tribal Town, uh, Council Member Jeff uh, McCoy, the OSU Native American Student Association representatives, and the Pawnee Nation College Student Association representatives. Let's recognize our tribal guests. We will continue with these, uh, and I want to, uh, if, 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 you know, if you need some, some legislation, I understand if you go ahead and applaud. Otherwise, please wait until we introduce all of our distinguished representatives uh, and former distinguished, well, former representatives who are still distinguished. Uh, our, our senator from Stillwater, the Honorable Jim Halligan, uh, Representative Lee Denny, Representative Corey Williams, and then we're pleased to have with us former state senator from Tulsa, uh, who worked with Robert Henry in the Capitol uh, and is responsible for having Angie DeBose portrait painted, the Honorable Penny Williams. Penny, I really welcome you. Thank you for coming. And of course, our Stillwater City Council, our Mayor Nathan Bates, Vice Mayor Chuck Hopkins, Councilor Daryl Doherty, Councilor Joe Weaver, and Councilor John Bartley. We appreciate all your support of the library and our community. And we have Deputy City Manager Mary Rupp. They're the ones who do all the work. Mary Walker, Chairman of the Oklahoma Commission on the Status of Women. We're glad you're here. As well as my colleague from Langston, the Honorable Dr. Joanne Haysburg, President of Langston University. <laughs> Sheila Johnson. Sheila, who is the Dean of the OSU Library and the Clerico Family Chair for Library Excellence. Dr. Glenna Matthews, the Co-Principal Investigator of the OSU Oral History Project which focused on the life of Angie DeVoe and uh, which led to the 1988 PBS documentary film, Indians, Outlaws, and Angie DeVoe. Uh, and Barbara Rash, co-producer of the 1988 PBS documentary film, documentary film just mentioned. 
Uh, welcome all of you. The uh, Stillwater Public Library Board, Library Board Chair Linda Rogers, who you met, along with Pat Darlington, Barbara Miller, Misty Smith, Tom Warren, Sally Harris, and Susan Simmons. Our Library Trust Board Chair uh, Lynn Bernane, and members Dr. Terry Miller, Larry Ludholm, and Joe Haney, as well as Matt Hall. Friends of the Library Chair Pat Murphy and past Chair Cindy Finkel and other friends and board members present. Please welcome all of them as well. I'd like you to refer to your program as a list of statute committee members. We won't take the time to go through them, but we appreciate their work tremendously. And as all the teasing that I've done about Bob Darcy, I want to give special recognition to Bob. This would not have happened but for Bob Darcy and his dedication. Um, and, our, and our sculptor, Phyllis. Phyllis Bandit, where are you? Here we are. There she is, Phyllis. She's carrying the blanket. Thank you. We'll bring you up here in a moment. I promise they're going to love it. Don't worry. <laughs> well, now to the main event. This is, uh, this is a real pleasure for me. One of my favorite friends for years and truly one of the great Oklahomans of our entire state's history is Robert Henry, who is, as you no doubt know, currently president of Oklahoma City University. Uh, but Robert has had a very distinguished service career to our state. Uh, from 1976 to 1986, he was a member of the Oklahoma House of Representatives. 86 and again in 1990, he was elected Attorney General of the state of Oklahoma. He was later appointed to the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit Court, uh, where he served at, as its chief judge. Uh, judge Robert H. Henry became the 17th president of Oklahoma City University in July of 2010 where he had been dean of the law school previously in 1990, from 1991 to 1994. Uh, Robert has his degrees from the University of Oklahoma, but he's, he's believe me, he's really smart. <laughs> he's overcome that, and he, uh, he received an honorary degree at a Doctor of Humane Letters uh, from the University of Tulsa and an honorary degree of Doctors of Law from Oklahoma City University. Uh, Robert's done a million other things. I, I'll mention he was the first chair of the American Bar Association's Middle East and North African Council. And he formerly served on the board of the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative uh, and has worked throughout the world uh, for the betterment and justice of all. Uh, I'll just say, oh, and I, is Jan here? I don't, okay, well, you're married to Jan Rawls. I don't know if you recall that. <laughs> he was a very successful dentist in Oklahoma City, which explains the great choppers Robert has. Uh, I just, I really need to show more dignity at events like this. I just want to say that I don't think there are many scholars uh, in our state that, uh, that exceed the talent, the curiosity, the interest, and the insight of Robert Henry. Uh, I respect him in so many, for so many things, but mostly I'm just proud to call him my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Robert Henry. much, Burns. You are indeed my friend, and you are the friend of all Oklahomans, and especially all that have any connection with Oklahoma State University. <laughs> I am here today, the, trying to get organized here. There's no place to put books at these libraries. Uh, <laughs> I am here, too, because I was asked by my dear friend, Burns, and I think I saw Ann here. There she is. She's wearing orange. I was asked by Burns to come visit and teach his class where I talked about this book, Oklahoma Footloose and Fancy Free. And at the end of the class, Professor Darcy asked me to come be here today. So uh, he is, he is a, as yet, controlling what happens. As we say here. Um, it is a joy to be here to dedicate something to one of my two favorite Oklahomans of historical bent. One was an Indian and the other wanted to be. Will Rogers was an Indian. And he was fabulous. And he said famously at Symphony Hall in Boston, 
a blue blood group of Bostonians. He said, I didn't come over, my ancestors didn't come over on the Mayflower, but they did meet the boat. <laughs> and I always liked that. He had his great Cherokee sense of humor that carried him around the world. And he really was just the ideal great American. Uh, someone created an organization that was for 100% Americans. Rogers thought that was kind of fraudulent to try to categorize people that way. This organization was called America First. So Rogers called a press conference and he said, I'm creating a new organization. It's called America Only. And we'll only have 200% Americans in our organization. <laughs> he was a person who thought you should be known and categorized and evaluated by what you did. Angie Debo, to my knowledge, was not Indian. But there is no person in the history of this planet who has done more to preserve the dignity, the culture, the intellect, and the contribution of our first Americans. She would be indeed honored that one of the most distinguished American Indian leaders in our history, Governor Anna Tubby, is here today. She would be honored and humbled by the fact that these medallions from the tribes decorate her statue. She would say, what's all this fuss about? Uh, and I would say, well, it's just that you spoke truth to power when no one else would. And you spoke as an independent scholar who was not given a job by your alma mater, but fortunately was employed by Oklahoma State University. I want to tell, cognizant of the time, I had some more things I wanted to say, but cognizant of the time, I just want to tell a little story. Um, after, in the 80s, after we were not able to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed in Oklahoma, something that was sad in the state that celebrates the myth of the pioneer woman. Now keep in mind, a myth is a statement of classical truth. All myths are true. That's why they're myths. Uh, they tell a story. They tell it in a different way. But all myths are true. You go look in the old dictionaries and they will explain that. A myth is a, a word that really tells, t tells a classical truth. And there was nothing more true than the pioneer woman. Uh, the women advanced this state more than men. They moved the, this state forward. And yet we couldn't pass the Equal Rights Amendment. We had to rely on the courts to do that now. Uh, discrimination based on sex is pro prohibited by courts. But Penny Williams and I were musing about what we could do to do something for women. And we determined that there was not a single portrait or sculpture burns of a woman in the state capitol. Can you believe it? In the 1980s, not a single portrait of a woman. So Penny said, we need to fix that. And I said, we certainly do. I said, it needs to be Kate Barnard. And she said, it needs to be Angie DeBoe. And I said, well, but Kate Barnard was the first woman elected to office. She was elected when women couldn't even vote. She was the commissioner of charities and corrections. Penny said, I know that, but Angie DeBoe is alive and well and struggling now and has advanced things. She said, you need to read about her. Well, I took my homework and read about her, and I determined that Penny was right. And we swore a great oath that we would get a portrait painted. And if I were asked, as I often am, I spent 10 years in the State House of Representatives. I am a slow learner. <laughs> uh, but I did a lot of things. And people ask me, what is the most important thing that you did? And I said, it was getting Angie DeBose portrait painted. And they said, well, how could that be more important than this code or that code? And I said, because of the school children. And they said, what do you mean? I said, now every school child that comes to tour the Oklahoma Capitol has to learn about Angie DeBoe. They have to learn about a woman whose courage was so great that she spoke truth to power. She named the names of those engaged in a criminal conspiracy to defraud our First Nations. She named the names of sitting politicians, sitting United States Senators. And when she took and still the waters run and it submitted it to the University of Oklahoma Press, Everett Dale, who has the big tall building named after him, forbade its publication. We had to rely on Princeton University to publish it. And it remains 
one of the greatest stories of truth in our nation's history. A remarkable book. I have many copies, um, and I was going to read from it, but I'm not because of time. So I just want to tell you quickly that I called Charles Wilson, our great painter, and I said, Charles, we need a portrait of a woman in the state capitol. And he said, yes, we do. It needs to be Kate Barnard. <laughs> and I said, well, I used to think so too, but can I come talk to you about it? And so I did, and we met, and he asked for Angie's books, and he called me back, and he said, you're right. So then I wrote Angie, and she invited me to come to Marshall to see her. I drove to Marshall. I was attorney general then. I was late. And uh, I pulled into a filling station, uh, pulled into a little store there, and I said, I'd like to know, and they said, on the corner of Market Street in Oklahoma. <laughs> and I said, you don't even know what I want to know. They said, you have a suit on. You came to see Angie DeVoe. <laughs> they said, you better get over there soon because uh, the, the little local diner will be bringing her her lunch, and she, she'll want to talk to you before lunch comes. And they said, there's a beautiful yellow rose there in the front yard that you'll, you'll enjoy looking at. So I went and knocked on the door. Angie came, and characteristic shawl, brightly dressed in, in clothes that had a quotation of Native Americanism about them. And she spent our first time trying to convince me that she was not worthy of having a portrait painted of her. And I told her about Charles Wilson and that he would be coming shortly. And I convinced her to talk to him. She thought he might paint the painting that day. She didn't know what would happen. She was dressed if it happened. And he came and I had the great joy of watching two of Oklahoma's greatest icons size each other up. <laughs> Charles was a little elderly and he was, you know, his time was valuable. Is she worth me painting? Angie, do I want to let this guy paint me? And then they had their one little disagreement that I knew was coming because Charles had told me about this. She said, now, Mr. Wilson, if you're going to paint me, I don't want you to paint me as I am now. I didn't look like this when I did my work. And he said, Miss Debo, if I saw Abraham Lincoln today, do you think I'd paint what I saw or I'd make something up? And she said, but I didn't have all these wrinkles in. He said, I don't have to put all the wrinkles in. I just have to put what I see. Well, they got to know each other pretty well. A few years ago, Charles sent me in the mail unsolicited the very first pencil sketch that he drew of her that day. I have a huge art collection. If there were a fire in my house, that would be the first thing I would take with me. It was a remarkable, remarkable study. When the painting was unveiled, Dr. James Ralph Scales, former Dean of Arts and Sciences, Oklahoma State University, was the speaker. We gave Angie the choice of anyone she could want in the country. She picked James Ralph Scales, one of the great Oklahoma heroes. He spoke about the muse of Cleo, the muse of history. And he thought that Angie DeBow was Oklahoma's muse of history. It was an absolutely magnificent day, a standing ovation in the rotunda of the Capitol of a place where she was once persona non grata. <laughs> Everyone was there, the great tribes were there. As I helped her get back into the car and her walker, just before I closed the door, she turned to me and she said, young man, I know a lot about Oklahoma history. And I said, I know you do, Dr. DeBoe. And she said, and I just want to tell you that there are a lot of people who deserve this more than I did. And I said, well, we'll just have to part company on that. <laughs> I just want to close with my last trip to Marshall. When Angie died, I went back to the funeral. The funeral was not in her Methodist church. It was too small. The funeral was in the Church of Christ. And I got there early, but still uh, I thought I might be in trouble, that there might be no place to, to sit. There were actually a few seats. And Charles Wilson and Henry Bellman invited me 
to sit with them. Angie was lying in state with her Phi Beta Kappa key. She's the first woman member of that organization in Oklahoma. And I was amazed that it wasn't full to the rafters. It later filled. And then as we left, and we walked downstairs to walk out, I saw the basement packed with the citizens of Marshall, Oklahoma. They knew Angie. They gave the good seats to the out-of-towners. How proud she would be of their generous spirit. Uh, there are few greater than this woman, and she would be so pleased to be affiliated with the library in the city where her beloved Oklahoma State University resided. It is my great honor to be here and raise my voice one more time on her behalf. My only advice to you is, if you haven't read Oklahoma Footloose and Fancy Free, at its age, it is still the best historical book written about the state of Oklahoma. Thank you very much. Robert that is uh, that's just wonderful and by the way you know Robert's quite a fan of our university and the people that have served here uh, another distinguished Oklahoma State uh, individuals Dole Reed who uh, was our ran the first art department at Oklahoma State University and is a prolific artist and his art hangs in most of the major museums around the world and Ann and I received our first uh, Dole Reed from Robert Henry but he hasn't given us any more. Uh, and he has a lot of them. Uh, the next introduction I want to make is uh, somebody who is very, uh, is, is a great Oklahoman and a great uh, servant to his tribe uh, and has led his tribe, I think, to uh, really prosperity that no one would have imagined. Uh, he's a very uh, inspiring leader. He is the governor of the Chickasaw Nation, and he too, I am proud to say, is my friend. Please welcome Governor Bill Anatubby. Thank you, Mr. President, for mostly everything. I can't thank you for putting me after Robert Henry. <laughs> Wasn't that uh, so good? Uh, <laughs> great old woman, for sure. Chigma, and greetings from the great unconquered and unconquerable Chickasaw Nation, a nation known for its bravery and more especially as intrepid warriors, never known to have lost a battle. We're also known for our humility. <laughs> it is a, it's absolutely a great day. And I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak here today during this wonderful tribute to one of Oklahoma's most significant historians. And truly, one of the most important historians for American Indians in Oklahoma, for, for sure. And it's certainly an honor to have our tribal seal uh, to adorn this statue. Now, it's already been said, but I'll say it again. Angie DeBow did more for Native Americans than she probably ever knew. Her work enlightened America not just those folks that here in Oklahoma. It opened eyes and revealed a hard truth that many people didn't realize had occurred. It may be a sad part of Oklahoma's history, but it had to be told. But it was told by a brave young woman, and in that telling, she faced 
adversity. But she told the truth in spite of having every reason not to. Now, usually one of the criteria for being a brave is to be a man. But I think we can loosen the rules a little bit, guys, don't you think, <laughs> Native American? And we can call her a brave. She was truly brave. You know, the, in a sense, it, it had a negative effect on her career that she was fighting so vigilantly for. And maybe she never reached the potential in one side of her life that she wanted to. But she did something bigger than succeed in a field dominated by men. She opened the eyes of America. She changed the way Native American history was told. Almost a decade before the term ethno-history was ever coined, she was telling the Native American story using words. She was our voice. She gathered untainted facts and wrote painful passages about what truly happened to Native American tribes during the formation of the United States and the state of Oklahoma, about our loss of land and the deception that came with statehood. Though it was a hard story to tell, a difficult piece to write, she did it anyway. Her books, Still the Waters Run, and the rise and fall of the Choctaw Republic still impact Native American scholarly works today. Her work also had a great impact on Native American law. For years before her books were published, court cases in United States law still supported the Euro-American discovery and conquest of appropriating land from indigenous peoples. But through her publications, Native American tribes began to prevail in the court system by using her works as evidence of wrongdoing and violations of treaty rights with the United States in regards to the loss of their lands. Her bravery defied a system of ignorance, a system accustomed to looking the other way. She helped Native Americans reclaim their lawful rights to reclaim their dignity during a time when it was being unmercifully stripped away. We owe this woman much, very, very much. Not only because she paved the way for so many, uh, for so many, with her tenacity and vigilance, but because through her steadfast truthfulness, she preserved real history. Her legacy will continue to inspire women, historians, and Native Americans for generations to come. It seems only fitting for the seals of our great nations to border the base of her statue, for, her, for as her works helped raise up the Native American in the eyes of the world, we certainly now raise up Angie. We uphold her memory and promise never to forget what you did for us. Thank you. You know, in our library, the book uh, where Stillwater's Run, and Stillwater's Run uh, is over in the library with Angie's name in it. And as was mentioned, it was not published when she submitted it. And uh, one day she received the book, and it had been published by Princeton, unbeknownst to her. So she, she had this tremendous uh, literary success and didn't even expect it. And I'm sure she would not expect this today either. Uh, I'd like now to introduce a very important leader in our community, uh, a very prominent uh, CPA, uh, who will make an important uh, uh, introduction, and that is Mr. Tom Duggar. He acted like he didn't know what I was talking about. I am 
the unenviable uh, task of following uh, three great speakers and I uh, started to say uh, that uh, everything they've done today just epitomizes the effort, the care, and the love for Oklahoma that Angie DeBoe exhibited throughout her life. There is one thing, and by the way, I also will not be giving a speech, and I know everyone will be happy about that because my purpose is to unveil the statue of Angie DeBoe. And so let me move directly on to that. So let me just say, since we've introduced distinguished members and of the community and of the state, that everyone here is a distinguished Oklahoman and we're proud of it. And even if you came from another state to be here today with us, we're proud to have you here because that is the very essence of Oklahoma. So, distinguished guests and representatives of the Indian tribes of Oklahoma, citizens of Stillwater and Payne County, and ladies and gentlemen, the events today, as well as the programs of our library during the past month, have led us toward this moment, the dedication of the statue of Angie DeBeau to the city of Stillwater and the public library. I would like to ask Linda, our librarian, because no one could receive it as an official of the city that is any more important as Angie would have viewed it than a librarian themselves. So Linda, would you come up with me, please? People that are on the committee that are going to be helping unveil the uh, statue, D David Thomas, Bill Bird, and Jim Walton. And they're behind me, I understand, and so I'm gonna get out of the way here in just a second. So accordingly, as a member of the statue committee, and on behalf of the committee, the Friends of the Library, the Library Board, supporters and contributors, it is my honor to present to the City of Stillwater and the City County Library this symbol of recognition of our heritage and our pioneering spirit, the statue of Angie DeBeau. like she's here. I'd like to first thank the committee for asking me to do this. Uh, um, the, the content of my uh, presentation is a little bit different. Um, I don't consider myself a special person in, in doing this, just a person that uh, when asked to do something just to do the best I can and uh, have my grandson here uh, Shakota Palace who will, who will help out and um, uh, first of all it's good to see the uh, my relatives the uh, Muscogee Creek Nation here and uh, and all the relatives from the surrounding area Pawnees, Iowa's and I've been in this area for 25 years and live here in Stillwater and use this library a lot and uh, was at Oklahoma State 21 years and and Dr. Halligan wherever you are I enjoyed the time together here and uh, so it was just a good time but uh, what we'll do is uh, um, I'd like to uh, offer a prayer uh, in our Muscogee Creek language and do the best that I can with that and uh, it'll be the a prayer that you all know and that's the Lord's Prayer and, and offer that then and then my grandson and I will go out there and and we take all this very serious you know it's just not uh, an exhibition you know that you know we come out here that I come out here and and, and do this uh, as an exhibition for you just to put on something uh, but uh, that a, this lady was an outstanding lady for our native people and made that uh, a large contribution you know, as a result of her, you know, our lives are, are better among our native people, among the Muscogee Creek people. You know, as a full blood, I felt that. You know, I'm a full blood. Back in the 50s, they knew who I was. You know, they didn't mistake me for anybody else. 
And so through that effort and her effort, you know, our, our relatives, my relatives, you know, it, it made it better for us. <clears throat> and so when I was asked to do this, uh, I said automatically yes. And when I taught at OSU and taught at the College of the Muskogee Nation and now teaching at Bay Cone, uh, this lady here, uh, she's the first lady uh, that I want my class and, and young ladies, I want them to view her history. And we talk about it. And so that the uh, young native people will know the contributions, plus the young ladies to know what they can do as well. And that they have to take a challenge in their lives in order to help other people. So again, um, and then after again after the prayer we'll go out there and and I have Lakota relationships as well. And again we take this very serious, but I'll we'll provide <coughs> A blessing that <clears throat> when people come to uh, to view this they'll have good thoughts and come here in a good way and that's just basically what it is it's nothing uh, again I don't consider myself any kind of special person but we'll do that so uh, now if I could uh, have your reverence and uh, for for just a little bit and uh, if we can just go to prayer here. What give? Oh, we like this guy. She would have got a jog against. She had home make it a log against. My man, a fucka, talk like in. Mojinetta, Pomus. Moment, Pom a wheatly then, Wagas. A wheatly gia. That's him. Wagas a gia. Eat a bowman. Nagin, boy. Not Oski. Boji, Tai, if Kikida, Sibion Ayetska, Momes, O Wakada, Ashiboy Hcha, Omega, Yetkida, Momen, Lakida, Shinaki, Imonga, Omega. Amen. And this uh feather that I'm going to use, it's kind of interesting. I was thinking about coming out here and and uh, my friend, Dr. Leonard Brugier, was a part of the history department at uh, here at OSU and he's a Vietnam veteran. He passed away maybe about two years ago and I know that he was a, a fan of Miss DeBeau and, and uh, again he provided this feather for me and so I just thought it would be appropriate and just use it on special occasions and so and these types of instruments and these uh, feathers are just to be brought out at certain times but when we finish that will be the conclusion on our part.
Everything that was spoken to here today was true. Angie was my neighbor. I grew up in Marshall. Went all through school, graduated. Angie, when I was four, five, six years old, she was my babysitter. <laughs> she had one of them old pump organs. You know, you pump it and you pull out the plugs and you play the music. We'd pump that thing to death. You know, when he's over there. As time went on for a little bit, she was my Sunday. <laughs> the Sunday school teacher. Three years I had her, and you listened when she spoke, you listened. And when we left to go to other classes, we each received a Bible. I still have that Bible. Angie was an inspiration for the town of Marshall. We had Prairie City Days. Once a year, she led the praise. She was, gave us quite an honor. I heard these stories of the Cherokees, the nation, everybody. I, I was grew up listening to these stories. Didn't mean so much to me then, but I've read a book, so it makes a difference. I got a book over here, it's called The Tulsa. Autograph and came to me. So I, was, I didn't know about this until 11 o'clock this morning, so I got in a hurry coming from Manford over here to get here, so I made, I made sure to be here. But I am proud, and Marshall is proud, to be able to see something come from Marshall like this. One other lady sitting right, where is she? There she is. This young lady sitting right here. She is also from Marshall. I've known her for all my life. <laughs> Known her for her and her family. And I'm glad to see you here today. <coughs> so I want to thank you for anybody that's had anything to do with this. <coughs> thank you. Phyllis, we are just so thankful for everything you've done for us. As I said, you took our vision and you turned it into a reality, and we thank you for that. And now I know you would love the opportunity to get a closer look at our sculpture and the tribal seals. So thank you for attending our event today. Um, I also invite you uh, to refreshments. There's Indian tacos provided by the Pawnee Nation College Student Association and cookies. And um, in a few minutes, um, if you'd like to come inside the library in room 119, we'll be showing the 1988 documentary film, Indians, Outlaws, and Angie DeBeau. And we also have on display in the library um, Phyllis's work um, from foam to form. So if you'd like to see pictures of how she um, built this amazing sculpture for us, um, you can see that on display. So thank you all again for coming.